Welcome to RHI's Sociable City Interviews, where we meet with global thought leaders on nightlife and the social economy. Today, we are honored to be with Randall White, host and curator of 24 Hour Nation in the city of Dallas, Texas. Hey, Randall, it's great to uh, have you here today. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Me too, Jim. You've obviously Thank you. emerged as a global spokesperson for 24 7, and I'm really anxious to hear a little bit more about how you got to this point. So, Maybe you can start just by uh, uh, introducing yourself. Sure. Um, Randall White. I currently live in Dallas, Texas. Um, um, I grew up in rural Oklahoma and uh, was one of those um, Renaissance kids because I had a, a family of modest means that appreciated the arts and appreciated liter literature. And so... Um, uh, I was kind of this quirky kid in a small town in Oklahoma, and that started me on this um, uh, awareness of the value of arts and culture in our lives. I uh, mm -hmm. wound up going to college with a degree in theater, um, came out as an artist in residence working for a nonprofit organization. A uh, nonprofit organization eventually hired me for a you know, front office job in PR. Then I learned how to ask people for money. And then once you do that, your nonprofit career is set. So for yeah. about 25 years, I worked in the nonprofit sector in the healthcare, um, education, and arts, still trying to squeeze in theater at night as much as I could. And um, somewhere along the line, I think um, about 1990 or so, I can't quite remember the date, I wound up flipping over to the other side, to the private sector side, helping the yeah, private okay. sector and politicians. Uh, build better relationships with the community. And that's where 24-7 popped up. So I think, um, my, first, my first consultancy was, I can't even remember the date. Uh, no, it might have been in the late 90s. Um, I was hired by a major corporation, a Fortune 500 company, to resolve some community issues they had. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that opened the gates to this whole other side of the spectrum, not working for nonprofit, but working for for profits mm -hmm. who were trying to um, expand their support base um, in the community. And um, it's theater. You know, I've always I've always decided it's like theater. It's, um, you step out on stage and people are feeling one way you give them information and give them visual cues that lead them to another conclusion yeah. and uh i kind of come to the conclusion that almost everything we're about is theater yeah. so that that and uh, um it makes one very comfortable speaking uh makes one um able to be compelling Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, help uh, put ideas in people's heads and lead them toward them. Uh, mm -hmm. If you do it well, you lead them toward those new ideas with them thinking it's their idea. Yeah. And uh, uh, that led to a lot of political work. I wound up having uh, several political clients. We ran for about 10 years, we ran um, online communications campaigns for uh, a, a host of elected officials and candidates and uh, referenda. Mm -hmm. And uh, next thing I know, I'm, I've got a uh, a large scale lobbying practice where people are paying me to build better relationships with those elected officials. And that's where um, in 19, oh gosh, no, I guess it was about 2005, the uh, Greater Dallas Restaurant Association was a client. I was their local lobbyist and uh, a political action uh, wanted to curtail nighttime activity. Mm -hmm. uh, in some nightlife districts and uh, had a couple of referenda they were trying to pass. And uh, that's when um, someone slipped me a piece of paper about Mirac Milan and what was going on in Amsterdam and in Europe with the nighttime mayor. Uh -huh. And I discovered um, the lockout laws in Sydney. Yeah. <laughs> and then I discovered the Responsible Hospitality Institute. And from there on, I just locked in. I thought the nighttime economy is in jeopardy. And I also am passionate about it for hospitality reasons, arts and cultural reasons, workforce reasons, economic mm -hmm. development reasons. So here we are. Yeah, so you uh, put, put all your different experiences to, together, you know, the Correct. whole idea that life is a theater and it's a play. Correct. And that uh, a good playwright can write a, a nice script. And so what you're trying to do is, is write the script of 24-7. Uh, Correct. Uh, 
And so it was probably the early, uh, well, Merrick was, uh, was, was most not notable in like 2015, 2016. I think that's when. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not getting my dates right. I think it was 2015 was when uh, the Restaurant Association said, we've got to address this issue. It was about seven years ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so you've been following it uh, both through the global network and here in the U.S. Correct. Um, now, what what made you decide uh, your work uh, in that private sector, you know, working uh, uh, as an advocate for the restaurant association and 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 in and the work that you were doing through that group to really create your own little um, forum for this uh, kind of discussion? Well, it started out by the idea that. Um, uh, our city, the city of Dallas, was not yet ready to embrace the nighttime economy in the ways some of the other cities in the States are, and certainly many cities in Europe uh, have done so. And so we thought um, that we could start a you know, private nonprofit that would focus on that and put the nighttime economy in play in that perspective. And, and uh, so in 2015, yeah, the date's about right. That's kind of when the seeds of those ideas were planted. Um, I actually retired from working, closed my practice um, uh, a couple of years ago, and then spent all my volunteer energy building this nonprofit organization, this volunteer-powered nonprofit organization called 24 Hour Dallas. And uh, we had memberships, corporate memberships, individual memberships, had a, a host of members of volunteers, a great dynamic board uh, advisory council, and we were just putting the nighttime economy in play in Dallas, and that connected us also, cemented us more with the, the whole movement in the states, mm -hmm. and built built up this volunteer core, um, and then handed it off uh, at the end of May of this year of 2022 to, uh, to the team, and uh, because um, I, I wanted to also retire from volunteerism. It takes a lot. Being a full-time volunteer and managing um, a volunteer-based organization is a lot of energy, but there are still pieces to the nighttime economy that I love, and that's where 24-Hour Nation came from, and that's where I'm, this is really a pastime now. This is me communicating on the web, doing podcasts, being an advocate, being an mm, evangelist, if you will, in the States for the mm -hmm. nighttime economy. And uh, I'm just doing this as a personal passion. It, it seems to be gaining momentum because uh, you also have the Nightcap Alliance, which is sure. uh, the association of US uh, night managers and you know, what some of well, the to as the night yeah. managers. So. And I'm pleased to say that uh, the city of Dallas was finally looking at the uh, um, uh, nighttime um, advisor, a nighttime manager position. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks to uh, uh, a couple of city employees who've been through the Responsible Hospitality Institute Sociable City uh, uh, conferences a couple of times, and yeah. th they're getting it. They're ready. Uh, and yeah. I think it's incredibly important to not only Dallas, but to all of the urban centers in the state of Texas, that they focus on that. And yeah. if my perspective is from the economic perspective. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, coincidentally, <clears throat> next week I'm talking with Brian, uh, who's the president of Nightcap Alliance, and then also Dominique from Orlando and uh, Tina from uh, Sacramento. So we're gonna do a state academy. That's great. In, um, in Texas, California, and Florida, just Perfect. to introduce that whole idea of, of how to create an office and how to, what, what the staff's role is and kind of external functions that are necessary. You know, Brian uh, in Austin, uh, has uh, as I was kind of communicating with him as well about the idea that we need that internal staffer, that city hall, who's the point person for being able to cut across all the silos. You know, like most cities, we've got all these departments that can be part of the solution collaboratively, but getting them at the same table is, is a difficult thing. But the private sector has actually an ability to do that perhaps in a way that if you're an employee of the city, you're maybe not able to. You know, there's this pressure that can come from a, a private nonprofit. And here I was bemoaning that we didn't have a city hall representative who could serve that role. And Brian and some of the others are going, you know, what we need is a private sector partner doing that. So yeah. it's it's an interesting balance. Um, we're kind of we 24 hour Dallas was kind of a quasi um, 
Hospitality Alliance, not unlike what Dominique Greco has in, in Orlando, but the, our coalition here was bigger than the hospitality sector. We had other nighttime forces involved. We had commercial real estate, we had um, um, healthcare, um, uh, we had certainly the arts and cultural world, we had hotels who are perhaps not necessarily involved in some of the other alliances. I really like Michael Kill's model in the, the UK, the Nighttime Industries Association. He and I had a chance to talk the other day and I, I think there is a power of, um, of all of these nighttime industries coming together and sharing a mission, a political power that is mm -hmm. untapped, is untapped. Well, you know, I, 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 uh, off, off on that tangent there, and then I'm gonna ask you what you think about the future. Okay. But, um, you know, we're, we're looking at states like Florida and Texas and California because uh, they're states that either have or, or, or are moving towards having multiple cities uh, Florida, as the best sure. example, where you have Orlando, Fort Lauderdale. Now we just finished working in St. Augustine. Right. And you have other cities that are looking to work on that. But um, as you probably know, being involved with the Restaurant Association, that sometimes uh, things that need to happen locally uh, are inhibited by state regulations or state resources. And so as you create a collective network of people who are trying to work on these issues, um, <clears throat> even like what you're proposing, this 24-hour licensing scheme, right. uh, there has to be some mechanism in place that would uh, allow for uh, a, a city network to, to become almost an advocate. Yep. And as you said, if it's, if it's a combination of both the public, uh, private, and government sectors, all advocating, it becomes more difficult at the state level to see it as just a private sector initiative. You know, they just want to sell more alcohol. Right, so. right, right. Well, and if you can if you can diversify that coalition so it gets outside of just the alcohol licensed businesses, it even has more impact in terms of economic growth, urban economic growth, um, tourism. Um, mm -hmm. And, and the folks that are um, behind arts and cultural organizations, music organizations, the gig economy, the healthcare industry, these are not necessarily folks that would kind of fall into the, the um, uh, licensed um, uh, mindset. You know, they're not easily dismissed. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the biggest political donors in the, in the state of Texas are involved in those other sectors. And yeah. so uh, I, I just think there's a force there that's untapped and has the opportunity to be tapped and uh, bring about change. The other thing we have in Texas, of course, is we've got these three economies. We have the urban, we have the suburban, and then we have the rural Texas. And those are three very distinct voices. And politically, it's hard to span that in a state mm -hmm. like Texas. And at the same time, as, as your own organization is demonstrated by working with some of the smaller markets in the country, and as we've seen through the Nightcap Group and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Joe O'Reilly in Iowa City, Iowa City has decided that its nighttime potential is strong for building community and keeping economic activity in the city, not letting it be lost out to urban sprawl. And I think any city in the states has the potential to look at that. Mm -hmm. This is the model in Europe. And yeah. uh, my favorite experiences in cities are at night. You know, there's nothing like, there's nothing like a, a drizzly walk in Seattle um, uh, at night on the way to a restaurant or uh, getting off the Metro in DC to go to a theater production at night. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, that experience, I think, brings us back together, especially as we're coming out of the pandemic. We need to get together. We need to find out what we have in common and what lifts us up. And the night has the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Well, you know, we worked with Seattle when they tried to have what they called the flexible hours right. for uh, venues to be open right. uh, at different uh, times of the day and night. Um, and there was a resistance uh, from multiple sectors, even sure. though you had the police and the city council and the mayor uh, all advocating for that change at the state level. Uh, but it never got out, mostly because it was a time when they were also legalizing cannabis. So sure. I think the state licensing authority had some difficulty here in California, where I'm at. Um, uh, uh, Senator uh, Weiner has introduced legislation multiple times to 
at least in fact, it's come up again with the pilot program allowing, uh, I think seven cities to experiment with a 24 seven sure. licensing. But there's two questions I have for you. Okay. What have you uh, experienced, you know, from pushback, you know, as to why this, this, this idea uh, of, of allowing businesses to open beyond, you know, whatever your closing time is, <clears throat> uh, which is very much alcohol oriented, like sure. you said. Um, and then secondly, uh, I've been picking up information uh, from cities that with the changes in how people work, right. uh, that the daytime socializing and going out during the daytime, that there's a market emerging, perhaps even where you're going to have uh, dance clubs uh, like they do in Europe open during the day. So when people take a break during the day, they could go out dancing. So. So when you talk twenty four seven, right, you, you your emphasis seems to be mostly on extending the hours that businesses can operate, but but how do you define twenty four seven from a more holistic point of view, and what have been the pushbacks that you've been getting? Well, well, we're we are no longer a nine to five nation, period, and I think uh, that came to to. Um, uh, sharp view during the corona the peak of the coronavirus pandemic it's not over yet and um the, when people began working from home and working at all hours from home and and uh, so part of the pushback we get of course here is when bars close at two and everybody's dumped out on the street at the same time and there's noise and there's racket and there's all this kind of um, uh, conflict between the folks who live near a place and the people who uh, support or own businesses in the nighttime di district that's adjacent. And politically, that's a particular dynamic because the folks that own the nighttime businesses or go to the nighttime businesses or work in the nighttime businesses don't necessarily live there and aren't necessarily the registered voters for the elected officials that represent that district. And so you've got elected officials who want to respond to their constituents, which may not be these customers or these business owners. And that conflict is the is the challenge. That's really where 24-hour Dallas was born. It was out of that conflict. The residences wanting to shut this stuff down because it was disturbing them. And yet, a lot of these residential communities have been built up around the entertainment districts because of the proximity to what they offered. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very odd dynamic, and it's one that politically um, it requires a political solution um, and that's really kind of what gave birth to uh, 24 Hour Dallas. Now, I'm, I'm very intrigued by the conversations with some of our friends in Europe, where they're talking about extending um, uh, closing hours or uh, limiting hours of operation for liquor service period. Uh, one gentleman told me that um, in, the, in Ireland, I guess, or perhaps one of the, maybe it was, maybe it was Amsterdam, the folks, you know, will leave the bar, folks that work by night and then go to a bar have a drink with friends then are going home at the same time people are going on the public transit system to work mm -hmm. and then it mitigates a lot of the kind of noise and conflict and worry of course here in the south we also have a race plays in that it seems mm -hmm. to be that if these were all white people leaving bars at two it'd be better mm -hmm. but that these are also latino or uh, black individuals leaving bars, the cultural differences cause a lot more anxiety. Yeah. yeah. So these, these are the types of things that, you, that you've seen. Yeah. Uh, but in, in a way, if one were to truly embrace America as kind of a, a country that's built around immigrants and diversity Correct. of the people who come here, nightlife really is the, is the, is the, the, the picture of that. I because agree. Because it does create the opportunities for that inter- generational, interracial, and in, 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 inter-ethnic background. And, and a lot of our food, you know, the whole fusion of food, right. and even now with mixology and, and the creation of drinks with uh, ingredients that come from other countries that are only introduced because of the diversity of the population, you know, that the, the way how, how people uh, listen to music and the, and the influence of different music genres on our culture and the way I agree. we eat all of these things are really a reflection of that that diversity but what you're saying is that sometimes it's not necessarily embraced that way and it's it's a barrier uh, to well uh, i agree and it's uh, we live in a world filled with fear you know we have people who are af af afraid of the dark they're afraid of cities they're afraid of different people and different experiences I believe the nighttime economy offers solutions to that. 
exactly from what you're talking about. We can still come together around a, a restaurant that serves uh, Afghan food. We can still come together at a, a, a bar that plays, you know, black jazz music. It's the solutions, but it's going to require this bigger coalition, I think, that to help persuade those folks who are frightened of difference and frightened of different people. You, you asked about the daytime economy. That's very interesting. You know, my focus has always just been on the night because I love the night so much in cities. Um, uh, the architecture of it, the lighting of it, the uh, experience of it, the whole social X aspect of it. But again, with the whole shift in how we are working now and the gig economy and the fact that somebody here may need to work with somebody on the other side of, wor of the world. You, you and I have participated in conferences, phone conferences that are global and mm -hmm. it, it, you never know what time it is with somebody else on the yeah. call. And yeah, yeah. I just think that um, uh, in the generational differences we currently have too, people want to enjoy the world and they want to enjoy each other and that sociableness that is important uh, that the night has often been, mm, it's often been exclusive to the night. Maybe not anymore, maybe not yeah, that's anymore. A, that's a good synopsis of what you see the future as being. And this has been an enlightening conversation. I, I particularly enjoyed your observation about distinguishing between rural, suburban and urban Correct. Uh, 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 lifestyles, which have to be reflected in, in policy and practices. Exactly. And, uh, ways in which resources are developed and that right. one size won't fit all uh, in terms of that mix. So that was very insightful. I appreciate the work that you're doing and we look forward to continuing to have this discussion. Thank you, Jim. And I uh, continue to look forward to being an evangelist for the night.